How should we think about the relationship between the mind and the body? Behaviorism provides an answer to this question that takes science seriously. Previous positions in the mind-body debate did not do that. Substance dualists, such as René Descartes, believed that mind and body were two substances. The problem with this was that the position implied that the mind and the body could not interact. Well, they clearly do. By nevertheless sticking to dualism, the dualists did not take science seriously. George Berkeley's idealism was not affected by the interaction problem because it was not a dualism but a monism. Berkeley argued that to be is to be perceived, which made the physical world dependent on the mental world. Because of this, the physical is clearly not a substance, because a substance is what can exist on its own. Idealism also proved untenable, since Berkeley wanted to show that all properties of physical objects exist because they were being perceived by an observer. By not reasoning well, he did not take science seriously. Behaviorists, on the other hand, took science seriously. Science must be as objective as possible. That's why in science, we cannot accept things that are subjective. In philosophy, we find an argument for behaviorism with the philosopher Gilbert Ryle. He stated that the mind is nothing more than a collection of behavioral dispositions, which means that under specific circumstances, someone exhibits a certain behavior. Compare this with a sugar cube that has the dispositional property of being soluble. If you drop the sugar cube in a glass of water, it will dissolve. This is all there is to it when it comes to being soluble. There is no mysterious dissolving power in the sugar cube. The same goes for the mind. That people have a mind means that they display certain behaviors in certain situations. If you think there is more, then you are making a category error. Ryle explains what a category error is with the help of an example of someone coming to a university for the first time. Suppose such a person visits Tilburg University and is shown around there. They get to see the lecture rooms, the offices of the lecturers and researchers, the baby lab, the restaurant, the library and the campus cafe. What should the guide say if this person notices that what they have been shown is all very nice, but that they wonder where the university is? The guide must then explain to this person that they incorrectly think that there is something else besides the lecture rooms and all the other things they have seen, namely the university, which is independent of that. They thus think that university is a separate category. It is easy to see that you are stuck with a pseudo-problem. When you have seen all those buildings, you start to wonder where the university is, and you can search for it all you want, but you won't find it. Something similar applies to the body-mind problem. This is also a pseudo-problem according to behaviorists. If you think that someone has a separate mind in addition to the behavioral dispositions, then you make the same category error as someone who thinks that there is a separate university in addition to the buildings. If you are making this category error, then you end up incorrectly wondering how the mind can affect the body and how it causes certain behavior. If behaviorism is right, then we can rewrite sentences that contain references to mental states without loss of meaning into long, complex sentences that describe the observable behavior of people. A sentence like, Mary has a headache, contains the word headache, that seems to refer to a subjective, unobservable mental state. We can rewrite the sentence in such a way that this word no longer appears, and that a reference is only made to observable behavior that Mary would exhibit under certain conditions. This sentence then becomes something like, Mary is sitting still in her chair, and if we were to offer her an aspirin, she would take it. If we turned on the stereo, she would ask us to turn it off, etc. However, there are a number of problems with behaviorism. The first problem is that we must use etc. in the rewriting of sentences with mental terms, because it is simply impossible to describe all the behavioral dispositions needed to formulate a sentence that means the same as the original sentence containing the mental term. In our example, this also means that if we offered to do the shopping for Mary, she would accept that offer, and that if Mary would go shopping herself, she would walk very slowly. The paraphrasing is always incomplete and therefore not equivalent in meaning to the original sentence with the mental term. A second and more serious problem is that the paraphrasing of Mary has a headache omits the most important part of the headache. Of course Mary would take an aspirin if she had one, but that is not the most important thing about having a headache. The most important thing is that it hurts so much. Is it really a category error to think that the pain is different from the set of behavioral dispositions? 
Most modern philosophers believe that this is not a category error, and many behaviorists admitted later that of course they believed that mental states existed. However, the prevailing idea was that it was unscientific to talk about them because they are subjective. A third problem that Ryle himself noticed was the question about what the thinker does. The activity of the thinker is thinking, but in principle, he can do so without showing any behavior. How could behaviorists break it down into behavioral terms? Ryle has conceded that he has never been able to find a good answer to what the thinker does. Although behaviorism took science seriously, by only talking about observable behavior, it actually left the mind out of the theory. What we want is a theory about the mind that takes both science and the mind seriously.